How is she? How are you? I'm good, thank you. So, long time no speak to, huh? A long, long time. I couldn't believe it when I heard your voice. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> So, so for all of our listeners on Glow Time Radio, this is Michelle Munro, daughter of the very famous and very lovely singer, Matt Munro. Michelle, would you like to say hi to Sandy and Mark and all of our friends at Glow Time Radio? Of course, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. So, Michelle, since we last spoke, you've got a book out, and the book is called The Singer's Singer, Matt Munro? The, the Singer's Singer, The Life and Music of Matt Munro, yeah. It was, it was um, one of those things, Tony, you know, oh, since my dad died, a lot of authors had approached the estate wanting to do the book, but it didn't feel right and, you know, would have meant giving them access to a lot of personal things. So we left it and left it. And then I had a, a near fatal car crash in Florida. And as I was being cut out of the wreckage, I had this awful thought that if it didn't survive, my son would never know more than his grandfather was a great singer. He well, didn't know the legacy, his roots, or anything, and it really frightened me. Yeah. And as soon as I was able, I decided to do the book myself. You know, uh, that is a very scary motivation, Michelle. Were you okay? Well, it, it took two years, but yes, I mean, it was a, it was a terrible car crash. It was a head-on collision. But um, it's just one of those things, you know, the wake-up call, really. Um, but it spurred me. I didn't realise it was going to take me five years to write. But you know something, Tony, it's like doing a giant jigsaw puzzle. If anyone that wants to look up their family tree or and look at their roots, it's amazing because you find a piece of the puzzle and you get really, really excited until you realise you've got another thousand pieces to find. And it was very much like that because, you know, I wasn't born until my dad was 30. You know, so he had a whole lifetime before I was born, so I had to trace back. And I did. I found people he was evacuated with, people he was in the army with. It was wonderful. Um, and I think slightly cathartic for me. Wow, that's that's incredible. So so let me let me just back up a little bit, Mishy. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, everyone, that Mishy is my, my nickname for the lovely Michelle. I'm going to go right back to the early 80s. Now, when I won't, me... I won't tell your, your listeners my nickname for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you, you better not. You, you better not. <laughs> But I'm going to tell everyone that I uh, I opened a wine bar with my with my wife Jane, and it was in Ealing. And Michelle uh, and her family lived in Ealing. And one day, this little girl comes in and says, "You know, hey, you're looking for bar staff." And we said, "Yeah." And I've got to say, the face looked familiar. And and everybody that's listening in, if you ever look up Michelle Munro and put her picture side by side with Matt, you look identical, the two of you. So it we, is a good thing. it yeah, is. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not a bad uh, look to have. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And so Michelle started to work with us in the wine bar, and she didn't tell us up front who she was, but we kind of found out uh, with bits and pieces later on as as time went on. And um, I got to say, Michelle, if you need a reference, you know, hey, I can give you a damn good reference as a bar staff. You're really good, <laughs> but I don't think you. <laughs> Uh, okay, l- look, let's not go back that far, Mishy. People no, don't know no, how no. old we are, so we won't worry about that right now. No, that's a good idea. But let me ask you then um, about about your father. Did you find out anything that you never knew before about him? The, the one thing that was a real eye-opener for me is I didn't really understand the depth of the poverty that he'd come from and what a terrible upbringing he had. I mean, unfortunately, you know, he was born during the war period and the, their own home was, was bombed out several times and they had to move five or six times. He had one pair of shoes, he had newspaper in them because they couldn't afford to have anything sold, obviously. Yeah. And, and they literally ate hand to mouth. And really, when I think of his journey and how big a star he did become, it really gave him license to be rather big-headed and arrogant, but he was anything but. He yeah. never forgot his roots. It was very important to him. He was very, very proud to be British. And um, he was just a humble 
goal, really. You didn't really understand what all the fuss was about. Well, you know, Michelle, on that note, I've got to say, you know, since I knew that we were going to finally catch up again, I looked up his, his background and everything, and nothing about him has ever come across as being, you know, the big I am. You know, some stars come across as, you know, they're too big to speak to you anymore. Um, but that was not the impression on reading everything that I read about Matt. He was one of these people, Michelle, that never forgot where he came from. You know, i tell you something, because when I decided to write the book, I decided I wasn't going to write a fairy tale, because there's no point. You know, you're either going to tell a story or you're not. And I interviewed probably over 200 people from all around the world, because obviously the internet has opened wonderful doors by that way. And a lot of them didn't know I was his daughter on purpose. And I asked very, very hard-hitting questions, and I didn't get one negative. And still now, 30 years he's been dead um, in, in February, the anniversary, I still haven't had one negative. And that's quite an accolade, you know, that, uh, and it makes me even prouder to be his daughter. Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm going to give you a feather in your cap. Uh, everybody listening, Michelle has devoted her life to keeping her father's music going and um, she's she does public events all over the world and uh, I'm very proud of you Mish you you kept up with this you you kept his music going and the book I know is very hard to write well you know yourself you've got your own book out and, and I think really what spurred me as well what my mother was so thrilled about was that Every published book goes into the British Library, and no one can take that away. That's a forever thing. And Mum was so pleased that, that you know that Daddy was sort of had that. Yeah, how there. cool is that? It's important to keep the legacy going. Because, I agree. You know that music from that era. There was a wonderful stable of artists that came out of the sixties, and you can literally fill hours and hours on radio just playing those wonderful old great. Um, but actually, when I wrote the book, as you know, the very first award it won was in America. I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then I actually won an award in England for it. And I was so proud of that. Not, not for me as the author, but the fact that that many people would want to know about Daddy's life. But you know, he had such a following. Um, what you may not know is that Capitol Records has Sinatra. And uh, he left to form his own record company called Reprise. Mm -hmm. And sadly, Nat King Cole had passed away. So there was a huge hole in their repertoire. Yeah. So they took the unprecedented step of signing a British singer to the label, which meant we had to go and live in the States. And, you know, he had many, many chart hits over there over the years and appeared on all the, you know, the Ed Sullivan's, Merv Griffin, and, and all those wonderful TV shows. And, you know, it was a big deal. He should have stayed in America. The trouble was he got homesick. Oh, but um, when we were talking last time and you were, you were researching the book, he went through quite a, a dull period in, in his life when uh, nothing seemed to be happening. Now, tell me about what happened. How did he get back into going to Las Vegas? Well, the thing is that um, he had stayed very, very loyal to his manager, Don Black. And um, even though the contract had only been done over a handshake... And Don lent my dad seven pounds when, at the time where there was no money, and dad had a, a small gig and he didn't have the petrol money to get there. But he never forgot the favour and he stayed very, very loyal. You know, the minute that he broke away and he got new management and he kind of reinvented with a new PR agency, he was suddenly in big demand again. Mm -hmm. And he then got the call and it was inviting to, to have a residency at the Sands in Vegas. Six months in Vegas with your own show. That is, you know, is it? Well, it still is, actually. It's a big deal. And when you do that, you know you're, you're back up there, you know. Sadly, it was only for a few years before he got sick. Because he passed away. He was only 54, you know. He, he had a policy in those days of taping over the shows to save money. Oh, my goodness. So in February for the anniversary, bringing out a new DVD which include appearances from around the world that we've sourced. And if anyone out there that's listening has anything that you've taped on television or at a concert illegally, please do get in touch at mattmonroe.com. I would love to have a copy. Yeah, you might like a story, Tony. When I bought the website, I was rather torn because nobody spells our name right. I know. So they always add the E on the end. Or you, M-U-N-R-O. <laughs> My dad used to say... It's very simple, M-O-N-R-O. -O. It's an anagram of moron. <laughs> <laughs> but so I ended up buying three websites. We get about 5,000 hits a month. 
Yeah. And how did the book do? The book, Touch Wood, is doing fantastic still. Good. I mean, they extended the hardback for another year because it was doing well, and it's just come out in paperback uh, last September, and it's on the e-book business, you know. Yeah. So, so, in fact, after my book was published, I got an email from someone who purported to be Robbie Williams' father. We got chatting, and he came to the book launch, and then he saw at the back there were loads of quotes from everybody in the business. He said, could he give one? So, in fact, both Robbie and his father separately both gave quotes, which went in the fifth edition, the fifth reprint. Robbie said that by the influence of my dad, Karen Carpenter said the same thing. She only got interested in the music business because of my dad. Well, yeah, and, and in fact, other people like Michael Bublé, Monica Mancini, um, even even Rick Astley, a lot of those people have said that they got their inspiration from your father, from Matt Munro. Oh, That's very cool, Mishy, isn't it? It is amazing. It's a wonderful thing that people would sort of admire someone to that extent. That was part one of my interview with the very interesting Michelle Munro, Matt Munro's daughter, who's written a book about the life and the music of Matt Munro. We'll be having part two of the interview coming up after this song. <laughs> 